Before we get into the nub of this podcast, which is, of course, six ways to make your cruising life less stressful. Only six. Oh, well, there are loads out there, but <laughs> we reduced it to six just to fit in the time, to be honest with you. But do you want to tell everyone where we are first? Yes, for those of you benefiting from viewing this podcast rather than just listening to it, you will see behind us a gently moving vista of the island of Asahan. So we have managed to get away from the marina where we were stuck for a little bit with some issues. We'll talk about that another time. And we just hopped over to Asahan, which is full of cows, which <laughs> they're just mooing as, as we're talking now. It's a beautiful little spot. It's actually one of our favourite areas in the whole of the whole of the Lesser Sunda Islands, mm, isn't it? It is. We love it here. We've been here before, and so we know that this is a good place to wait out until the wind turns, because uh, that's our current plan. Mm -hmm. So, should we get into the podcast? Hello, I'm Liz. And I'm Jamie. Welcome to Follow the Boat, in which we discuss what it's really like to give it all up to live on a boat. And go travelling around the world. We've been doing it since 2006, and we're still at it. Each week we talk about our latest YouTube video. And about boats, sailing, travel, or anything else which floats into our heads. And if you leave a comment we like, we'll give you an answer and a name check. Peace, Peace and, and fair, fair winds. In this podcast, we're talking about things to help you be more relaxed, less stressed and more comfortable if you are a cruiser. Maybe for people who are just thinking about it, starting it. But these are all things that we've learned over the years that we think actually make life easier on a boat. We're not talking about sailing techniques. No, it's not about the nuts and bolts of sailing per se. It's, it's more about how you manage your lives on board the boat and how you make various systems and procedures just a little less stressful. Yes, and on that note, the answer is kiss. Do we have to? <laughs> no, definitely not. Um, uh, you've probably heard it before, but kiss stands for keep it simple, stupid, and we think this applies to pretty much most things on the boat. <laughs> yes, yes, it should in, in theory. But yes. of course, I think one of the issues with sailing these days is that systems have become more complicated and the onus is on us to stay on top of those systems. Yes, it is. So, but, what... but, but you're right, there are some things where we do try and keep it as simple as possible. Yeah, we do, to minimise the amount of things that can go wrong. That's the idea. Mm. So we've got six broad um, topics that we're going to discuss. The first one is your favourite one, which is establishing roles for crews. Yeah, that's basically, I'm in charge and you do what I tell you to do. Joking aside, that is, that is a point. There are certain times when, particularly when you're sailing, where you do have to have just one voice in charge. Otherwise, things do go tits up. You don't want to be discussing whether you're going to be going left, right, backwards, anchoring or not. Putting I, out the It's not a discussion, is it? I'm quietly grinning to myself because I'm thinking of only the other day. Do you remember I actually had a go at you afterwards? We were trying to move the boat uh, in some strong tides uh, along the pontoon of the marina. And... I was on the dock and I was asking you to come forward to grab a line and um, halfway down you just stopped and started having a chat with someone, didn't you, on the pontoon and I said, Liz, please, I need you up there now. You don't like being told what to do when it comes to those situations, do you? Name me one person who likes to be told what to do. <laughs> it's very different. Uh, just, just one thing on that. It's quite difficult when you are the joint owners of something and uh, it's your baby and it's your home for one person to take charge at any given time. I think we try most of the time to be fairly democratic in our choices. We, we are. I yeah. mean, you know, I think compared <laughs> to many people we've come across, yeah. we are very democratic, I would yeah. say. We're, we're pretty good like that. Just occasionally, though, um, you have to remind yourself, not you, you, yes. I'm just saying one, generally, one has to remind themselves yeah. that in certain situations, there needs to be one person giving the orders. And it is literally giving orders. And yes. I don't mean that in a kind of no, no. bullshy way. It's yeah, just, yeah. you know, orders have to be given. And those orders have to be undertaken by the crew without question. Because if you start questioning it mm. or saying, well, I've got a better idea, mm. you start to lose control of the situation. Agreed. And I think uh, being in marinas is actually a quite a good one when you're entering and leaving because there are people on the dock shouting orders mm. at me. You, you tend to be controlling the boat 
uh, with the steering wheel because she's very difficult to control. So you do that job and I do the lines. That's the normal way we do it, pretty much always. And we learned very early on that I don't throw lines or catch lines or ask people to throw me a line until you are ready. Mm -hmm. So quite often I'm on the boat and I have to say to people who are shouting at me, speak to the skipper, speak to the captain, yep. not me, speak to the skipper. Yep. Yeah. I mean, that's just one example. Yeah. But of course, this idea of having roles on the boat goes a lot further than that. And it, and it, it, it extends into our day to day lives. So Liz and I have an agreement well, not really an agreement, but we both enjoy cooking. Now, granted, you probably do the majority of it, but certainly when we're in lovely anchorages like this, you know, I, I have more time and more inclination to get involved in the cooking. Now, it may be that um, one of you is really good at cooking and loves cooking. The other one could be terrible. Uh, so, you know, you have this unwritten rule. OK, well, the majority of the time that person does the cooking. That has to be sort of evened out yes. with, you know, that other person perhaps doing a bit more of something else, like cleaning the heads. Well, or... it's quite it's quite straightforward. If one cooks, the other one washes up. Mm. So, and, and it's pretty easy to agree who's going to do the cooking. Um, we're lucky because we both enjoy it. But if only one of you enjoys it, that person should do the cooking unless they hate doing it all the time. You know, I mean, you work it out between you, don't mm. you? And it's important to establish those things fairly early on agree you know sit down with a drink and have a chat about who's going yeah. to do what there are things like um the watches of course which is a big one isn't it yep again that's uh that's a bit more sort of regimented mm. but to, again have your watch system in place and work out and you'll work this out who's more comfortable say doing the early morning watches mm. who's better at doing the sunrise watches mm. you'll work that out and but i think the thing is is to kind of stick to that especially when it comes to a watch system is to have a routine we talked about this recently didn't we about slipping away from a watch system where mm. you start to get comfortable and you do six hours because you're not tired mm. and that you can fall into the trap of let's say I do six hours I go to bed and then 10 minutes later when you're on watch an emergency happens and I'm so exhausted mm. from my watch so th that's an example of sticking to a regimented system mm. but generally around the boat I mean another good example when we hoist the dinghy I like to do it on my own because yeah. I actually enjoy the exercise of hoisting the dinghy. So, yeah. you know, you you know to hop off the dinghy, you'll maybe go and open up the boat while I busy myself with hoisting the dinghy. Yeah. It's little procedures like that. And it doesn't sound very important, but it can blow out into, you know, really bad arguments and, mm. and um, you know, differences of opinion that can get very bad. Unless you just you just have to write them down as rules and put them up on the on, on the notice board but you just need to agree them t together so it might be a couple it might be you with them some crew um if you're on your own you're fine but whoever it is agree it between you all yeah yeah and i think a lot of these as well they don't happen overnight either no. May maybe a watch system does but uh, other things you know various roles on the boat who's better at maybe doing some general maintenance on the engine who's better at changing filters on the water maker yeah. these come over time you know you, yeah. you, you kind of fall into a routine don't you yeah and with couples you do get the blue blue and pink jobs mm. they do seem to go that way the women does cooking cleaning and that sort of thing and the man does the more I know, technical stuff. Yeah, I think, um, I think you have to be careful saying that publicly because I'm sure there will be a lot of female sailors out there who say, no, that's not true. Well, I'm, I'm about, the one that does the engine. I was about to say, well, it's not always the way I was saying it can fall into that pattern yeah. and it's up to you if you don't like it to change it. Um, we, on the whole, you do most of the technical stuff. I'll help you when I mm. can and I do help on most things. The one thing I do do is the heads. <laughs> I have to look after the heads, um, you know, so I have to change all the bits and bobs and hoses and whatnot on that one. I took that one on fairly early, but you already had in, a lot of information in your head about electrics, electronics anyway, so you automatically took all that on, didn't you? Yeah, and there's some th some jobs that we enjoy doing. I mean, I'm sure yes. you love doing the heads. I love it. Yes. I live for it. I don't mind doing electrics, actually. <laughs> I'm no expert, but I actually quite enjoy it. Um, and I think the important thing is, is that one of you, if there's two of you on board, one of you doesn't end up becoming resentful mm. that they're always 
doing the cooking, that they're always mm. having to do the maintenance or going down underwater to scrape the prop. Mm. Uh, you need to avoid that kind of resentment and establish those roles fairly mm. early on and uh, both mm. both be happy with them. Mm. And if there's jobs now, they'd be like, you've got to share those jobs. Mm. Yeah. OK, so ob an obvious one is anchoring, but we're going to come on to anchoring a bit later. Yep. But certainly with anchoring, you know, one person's on the wheel and one person's up the front with the anchor. So, you know, that's and also looking for the right place something to think about as well so the next one we've got is systems generally systems number two that was what you were quite insistent on yeah and i think really the the sort of the overriding rule with systems is to be comfortable with them mm. and again this does come with time if you move on to a boat and you have very little experience of diesel engines, you're going to learn very quickly some of the foibles of yeah. maintaining uh, running a diesel engine. So when you say be comfortable with, what you actually mean is understand, don't you? You've got to understand your system. Yeah, because I think it's quite easy you know, we're all going lithium these days and some of the systems we have on board can be quite complicated. Well, a diesel engine isn't. It's actually really quite straightforward on paper mm. the problem of course is the issues that come up uh, at the worst time and occasion yeah. when when the shit's hitting the fan and just having a basic understanding of i don't know a few uh, troubleshooting fixes to try because if ultimately you do end up having to get some help yeah external help yeah which of course isn't always available when you're out there but if say you get a diesel engineer to come on board and have a look at your engine mm. you should at least be able to say well I've tried this and I've tried this and I've tried this yeah. and I know it's not this so just to have some kind of understanding of those systems manuals as well we in you know when we first started out we had some really good manuals and we often would sit with me reading the manual mm. while you went through things you know do as much as you can and that was a great way to learn wasn't it to do I think if you can install as many things as possible yourself. Now, I admit, the lithium system, I didn't, but I stood over our electrician while he did it. But other systems on board, a lot of the plumbing I've done myself, uh, you you know the heads back to front, uh, the water maker completely installed ourselves, even the solar panels. A lot of these things we've installed ourselves. So we have an understanding so mm. we're not running around in the dark when mm. something goes wrong mm. we at least have a starting point to work from mm. and that's really what i mean by understand your systems yes. you can't be expected to know everything about every system great if you can but uh, i think to 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 run a boat which is when you break it down there's a lot of complex systems on board um, to run a boat with absolutely no knowledge of anything and expect someone outside on land to come and fix these problems <laughs> when they happen uh, it's a little bit ignorant I think so you just need to have that kind of understanding yeah so once you do understand them that will make your cruising life a lot less stressful because yeah. you know what's going on and you know what it's you know it's just general isn't it knowledge is power it's good if you know there's a problem you know how to deal with it to a certain extent or what needs to be done something like that mm. now we did put um, in this part engines now, obviously, you're buying a sailboat, you're on a sailboat, and it's all about the sailing. But don't forget, engines are massively important on a sailboat. Uh, there are purists who don't have them, but most people, if they're going to be cruising around the world, will need an engine. You need it to get you out of trouble sometimes, and you need it certainly to go in and out of marinas and other tricky little spots, don't you? Well, and also, it run, it, uh, it's your backup charging system as yeah, well. Because of the alternator, we're going to get onto power next. But mm. yeah, so engines are quite an important thing. If you've got a choice, there's traditional and there's common rail. A lot of new boats come in, in common rail. The old boats were pretty much all old diesel engines from tractors, like our Perkins. But we had to buy a new engine and you looked at Yanmar and Kubota, didn't you? Yeah, and at the time, the only option available locally was a Yanmar and it was a common rail system. And th this was actually the first time I'd ever heard of common rail. <laughs> Uh, I think you'll find most uh, diesels nowadays, certainly in cars, will be common rail. And uh, you said that more and more new boats are coming with common rail diesels. Yeah. Uh, avoid them like the plague. And in fact, 
The guy who was selling that Yanmar Common Rail in Phuket at the time advised me not to buy it. Can you believe that? The actual no. salesperson said, well, if you're a Liverpool, don't get a Common Rail. Explain to people why. Well, they're, they're much more computerised. Yep. And so when things go wrong with a Common Rail system, uh, you need to plug in your laptop and have an engineer, uh, sorry, a computer science degree to yep. solve some of these problems. The advantage with an old tractor engine, a diesel engine, is that they can be fixed anywhere and we've seen this you know we've been in remote places and we've had people from land come on board and solve problems quite quickly because they're a known quantity aren't yes, they? Cer certainly over here all the fishing boats and they are everywhere fishing boats they're all basic traditional old-fashioned diesel engines so you can get help somewhere from everybody and we mm. have in really remote places had problems mm. and because ours is a straightforward tractor style engine it's been easy to solve had we had the Yanmar um, in places like those islands off the west of uh, Sumatra no chance absolutely no chance no. could we've had anything done no I, I think what you'll find is quite often the big charter companies for example, off the top of my head, Sunsail, for example, yeah. they're more likely to have common rail engines because they are based somewhere, mm. because the end, the boats come in every week and can be serviced and checked. Mm. And if there is a problem, you do have that person standing by mm. to help. But mm. uh, anyway, enough about common, yeah, so common there you rail. Go. So yeah, that's a, that. so, but it's a good example, like an mm. engine of systems and why you need to know how they work. And also of KISS, keep it simple, stupid. Keep yes, simple. very true. Next one, number three, is power. Yes. I had this as number one on my list because my feeling is if you don't have the right power set up, it will make your life a misery. Yeah, and that's exactly the right word, the right power set up. And you were reminding me of the exercise we went through when we yeah. first bought the boat. And actually, we've been watching newer sailing channels who have got this so wrong mm. because they didn't go through this basic exercise of working out what your power consumption is over yeah. a 24-hour period. Yeah, so you have to test every single item on the boat that draws any kind of power. You work out its amperage over a 24-hour period, then you add them all up, and that will give you a pretty close idea of what kind of power you're going to be drawing. Mm -hmm. And once you've got that information, you then know how much power capacity you need on the boat for making power sorry yeah so you, you know your batteries your alternator we've already said you know talked about those solar wind there's wave power there's all kinds of things isn't there but it's really really important that you get enough it's no good just saying oh, i'll have loads and loads of batteries because i've got uh, all these things you've got to power those batteries charge you? them got to charge yeah. them yeah yeah, and even on sunny days like this where we are, we have almost a kilowatt of solar power, which for 43-foot monohull is, is a lot. But, uh, you know, even we struggle sometimes, and there are days when perhaps we have to be a bit careful with the cooking because we have an induction cooker. Uh, that was simply to get rid of gas off the boat. Uh, so we have to be a, bit, a little bit careful, don't we? Yeah, but, we do. You know, I think on the whole, were it not for the in induction cooker and the fact that I've got a great big powerful desktop computer I think we'd be laughing because we have done our sums and we know what our average daily consumption is and we know that the lithium battery setup we have uh, works for us so it's really important to to do those sums when you first start and be realistic about the kind of power consumption that you have over a 24 hour period. And that has to include things like running your navigation system. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing an overnighter and you're sailing, you'd have no solar or engine to charge your batteries. That's a drain on your, on your power. So you have to take those kind of things into consideration as mm -hmm. well. In the Southern Hemisphere, certainly in the tropics, we've got 12 hours of sunshine a day. Had we been in the UK, certainly in the winter, very little sunshine. Uh, but a lot of wind. Mm. So we would probably, had we been in the UK, got ourselves a wind generator, which we've not bothered with here. We haven't mm -hmm. felt it necessary. But it will depend entirely on where you're going to sail and your setup and how it's going to work on your boat. So every boat's different, but really consider power as being kind of crucial to um, a comfortable and stress-free sailing cruising career. I think. Yes. Yeah. Now, you had written originally a discussion about batteries, which I, yes. you know, I, don't, I don't really want that discussion now. All I would say is, in summary, <laughs> is that obviously lithium is a lot more flexible, but you have a slightly more complex charging system. 
Um, so that will add a headache, but lithiums are a game changer. They really are. We did it and we never looked back. Did we, we never looked back. Yeah. Uh, but uh, prior to that, we had Trojan 6 volts, which were great, actually, because you could really hammer those Trojans. They took a lot of beating, but like any flooded lead acid, you can only take them down to 50% tops yeah. before having we to re did, yeah. recharge them and and again you have to be a bit careful about how you charge them they've got to make sure that they get you know up to 14.8 volts back into them uh, whereas with lithiums you can just hammer them with as much charge as mm. possible for a mm. quick recharge but uh, yeah i mean that's a discussion for another time but whatever power system you have you have to be comfortable with maintaining it and if it is flooded lead acid Topping them up every month, checking yes. the capacity. Now, that used to be one of my jobs, one of my roles on the boat, and I enjoyed doing that, so keeping an eye on them. Which reminds me, I mean, you don't have to do that anymore, which no. means you, you've got more time to do, I don't know. Make you coffee. Washing up. <laughs> yes, yeah, so there we go. So before we go on to the next topic, you just, we just wanted to do a quick word on winches, on electric winches oh, yes. specifically. Yes. So we have all manual winches on our little 43-foot catch we've got a lot of winches mm. but they're all manual uh, and we have talked about electric winches and how nice it would be to have one but we have seen some nasty things happen a friend of ours lost her thumb on an electric winch Ooh. someone else we know went across the indian ocean with some friends who are also sailors but weren't used to electric winches and managed to break his sails by over tightening them mm -hmm. so you know with this in mind we like to rethink winches. Did you know that liking and subscribing on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts helps us to get noticed? Go on, give us a helping hand. I do dream about electric <laughs> winches. I, th I think electric winches are great. Although I have to say, I really like the exercise from winching. Yeah, we don't get enough exercise and that's one way of getting it. Yeah. But I think, you know, the bigger your boat, the more likely you are going to have electric winches if money were no object and we could have them, I think the most important thing would be to have a manual override. Yes, yes. I think most winches are designed like that anyway, to have a manual override. That almost applies to anything, actually. It does, yeah. I yeah. keep going on about electric toilets. Yeah. Why have they not invented an electric toilet that has a manual override? They may have by now. They may have know? done, yes. Because yes. when, when electrical things go wrong, it's just gone wrong, whatever well, the item is. Yeah, and it's a real headache, mm. you know. When your anchor windlass stops working, that's a real headache mm. when you're anchored in 20 plus metres of water. Yeah, it really is. And the ele electrics on sailboats are the first thing, perhaps closely followed by hoses, to go wrong because the sea is just so corrosive mm. and uh, electrics go wrong a lot. They do. Stay on top of your electrics. Yeah, as Liz says, I think, you know, 95% of the time when something goes wrong, it's almost always some connection somewhere, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. But talking of electric winches, the other thing that we don't have, which leads us nicely into our next oh, uh, yes. subject, of course, is the dinghy. Yes. And a lot of people have electric winches oh, no. to winch up their dinghy. Mm. But again, like I said earlier, I actually like the <laughs> exercise of manually hoisting the dinghy. But let's just talk about dinghies because yes. this is another area where I think you know we've had a lot of experience with dinghies and it's another area where we can make our lives just a little less stressful by careful consideration with the type of dinghy that you end up using and how you use it it's often way down the list when you're looking to buy a boat so you don't think about the dinghy i mean we bought this boat and it had a dinghy well it's got a dinghy that's fine but it was an awful dinghy it's terrible it was useless <laughs> um so we've had the opportunity over the years to buy different dinghies and with our experience, the things that the two things you have to think about are its size and weight, really, uh, because can you lift it? Can you lift it without an automatic electric anchor winch? Can you get it onto the boat easily on your own, or if you have another one person with you, the two of you, can you do that? Um, can and, you hoist it up the beach? Yeah. That's the other thing. That's the other thing. Yeah. You know, it, it's, we've had to help so many other people who've got a 20, 20 horsepower engine outboard on yeah. it, three metre fibreglass dinghy that weighs probably close to 100 kilos, and it needs three people to get it up the beach. 
Yeah. And sometimes you can't anchor dinghy. This is something we try and do more of now. We do actually try and anchor our dinghy rather than taking it up the beach. Um, you know, in flat, calm waters, anchoring the dinghy is actually, it's easier to do. But there are occasions when you do need to beach your dinghy. So you do have to be mindful of that. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's also, as you say, it's hoisting. And I should say, by the way, I try... We have slipped recently, but I try to hoist the dinghy every night. Yes, always, yeah. Um, and that's really for two reasons. The first one is security, although that's less of an issue in these, this part of the world. But the second reason is because sometimes when the shit hits the fan at three in the morning and you need to make an emergency exit and to get out of an anchorage, uh, you don't, well, we do not tow our dinghy. Yeah, I mean, that's something we didn't write down on our list, not towing the dinghy. We'll get onto that maybe in a minute, but that's being able to lift it up the beach and onto the boat is absolutely massive and getting on the boat at night you just you just should do it it's just good practice to do that mm. and be prepared going up and down the beach you know we, if you moor it in place in some of these places in southeast asia i mean thailand i can think around phuket area great long tides right you know 500 meters at least um the tides coming in it's just mud wrapped. with our dinghy we we're, were able to between us take it ashore through all that rubbish through yeah all that. i'm not sure about 500 meters that's <laughs> that's half a kilometer i'm thinking of um lippy co lippy yeah do you remember yeah really, really well maybe not but several hundred meters yeah, it's, sometimes. It, it can be a long way and yeah. when it's a flat beach and you've got to drag your dinghy make sure you've got a decent set of wheels and pneumatic yes. tires on the back of your dinghy as well really help with uh, moving it around uh, interestingly on the oyster o uh, owners forum there was a discussion about a brand of Dinghy, which I'm not going to mention, okay. but uh, they're well renowned. They're very cool looking, mm -hmm. and they are made of carbon fibre, wow. and they're supposed to be very nice dinghies. And someone gave a good assessment of them, good breakdown of them, the pros and cons. On the whole, you know, they came out as being excellent dinghies. But what they did mention was how skittish it can be okay. because it's so light and yes. fast and streamlined. Uh, and it's something that you need to be mindful of is, you know, when you're moving around in the dinghy, mm. is how safe do you feel? Mm. You know, our porter boat, which was mm. great for tying up to crappy old town docks because you could smash it and it was indestructible, was absolutely hopeless at carting jerry cans of fuel around because it would just sink in the water with no flotation. Not so good with waves, didn't like waves. Terrible with waves, yes. <laughs> So, yeah, you need to think about the waves. I mean, you do, if you're going to go short, think about the waves, think about the weather, think about the tide. You need to know all of, all of those things when you take your dinghy ashore. So are you, is, it going to, is the tide going to be coming in or going out when you put it wherever you're going to put it? Uh, just remember that. Also have an idea of the weather because sometimes if the weather picks up and you're in a certain anchorage that has fetch, you can have some blimmin' big breakers coming onto the beach and we've had our dinghy turn over in the surf. It might happen if you're anchored preferably get it out off the beach or preferably go back to the boat before that well the last hits the anchorage we were in off the west coast of uh, Lombok I remember that the the beach is really really mm. steep and to get back into it I had to climb right up to my waist <laughs> to get it past the breaking waves because if you didn't get it past the breaking waves you couldn't get into the dinghy yes. so um, it's definitely something that as you said you don't really think no. about but it can be stressful and i've seen someone turn over their dinghy trying to beach it yes. with three people in it and they the dinghy ended up upside down with yes. the engine running so just yeah be careful yes. of that i think the other thing as well is is and i don't want to come across as preachy here because we've all done it <laughs> but is to be mindful of how much you are drinking if you have to then operate your dinghy now they do say even when you're at anchor, you shouldn't drink. But, you know, we all do it. We all, or we all have done that. The accidents really happen when you're operating a dinghy pissed. Yeah, terrible. It's not yeah. a good idea. And again, we've all done it. We have all done it. When it's flat calm, it's, it's not so bad. But uh, So just tone down the drinking a bit or have a designated driver, someone who's, who's, who's actually going to navigate you back to the boat safely we know people who've just had some terrible accidents um yeah it's not clever really it's not it's not clever no, no. and we've done it uh, yes we've definitely done it we know it's definitely. not clever because we've done it and we know it wasn't clever <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing is is when you get your boat to the other end make sure you tie your dinghy up properly yes. we know someone who um 
evidently didn't tie his dinghy up. The next day, he woke up to find his dinghy was missing and he thought I was playing a trick on him. He thought I'd gone over to hide his dinghy. He found it in the next bay. It didn't had... somebody find it for him? And yes. It back? Uh, they left it on the beach, I think, yeah. with their phone number to say, we found your dinghy. So, um, yes, that... That can happen. Yeah, so, you know, it is important to think about dinghies, how you operate them, what you do with them. Can can you lift them? Pretty important, I'd say. Mm. Um, keeping an eye on it. I mean, you mentioned there lo losing it. So I think that if you're in a new place, somewhere you don't know very well, so you don't quite know, understand what's going to go on at shore with the, with the dinghy, um, if, if you don't know anything about it, I would say keep an eye on it all the time. If you can't secure it to a dock somewhere, somewhere very secure, I would want to be knowing where my dinghy is at all times because I don't know how that tide's going to work and I don't understand how the waves are going to work. So we generally, in new places, make sure it's really carefully up the beach and away or yeah, we can uh, see it. I think that's what, we're, that's what we do yeah. normally is we'll take it way over the highest water line Get it right up um, just into get the it, jungle. Get it, yeah, right up onto the onto the road if necessary. Yeah. Just so because again, you know, it's bad enough leaving your boat out of sight, mm. but also leaving your dinghy out of sight. If you've got to go into town and do your provisioning, mm. and you can can't see either of them, you've got to be comfortable with with both of them. Mm. I think doesn't talking about the boat being at anchor doesn't that bring us on to anchoring? Yes, it does. It does. Um... <laughs> Should we do that one next? Yes, and we're not going to discuss what anchor you should use. As every seasoned sailor knows, the discussion of anchors uh, comes up all the time and it's a conversation that will, it will never end. No, people it will are never end. discussing it all the God, time. Oh, so. people are so partisan about their anchors. It's, it's crazy. I mean, you have to get your anchoring right to feel comfortable. You really do have to get your anchoring right because you will never go ashore if you keep thinking you're going to lose your boat and you won't sleep at night if you think you're going to, you're going to drift off into the ocean. Yes, but before we talk about... Well, we're not going to talk about how you anchor because no. we've actually done a whole video on that. Yeah. I think the most important thing is to be happy with your ground tackle. Mm. That's the first thing. And actually, I did a piece to camera the other only the other day. Did you? Uh, which will come out in, a, in an episode in sometime in the future explaining our ground tackle setup and by that what i mean is how we've attached our chain to the anchor because right. that is really important and up until i changed the way we attach our anchor to the chain there was always well we were doing it wrong yeah and there was always a question mark as how strong is that mm. and the solution that we now use and have done for many years in fact uh, is considered probably the best way to secure your ground tackle to your anchor and, and to your chain, therefore gives us more peace of mind yes. when it comes to anchoring. And so, that, that's the important thing. Yes, I mean, on anchoring, just want to say when we started, we cocked up really badly on lots of occasions. So we're talking to you now through a lot of experience and what we've learned over the years. Um, so as you say, there's no such thing as a perfect anchor, but just just... So that you know, we've got a Rockner. We bought it in Turkey 16 years ago. Mm. Still got the same one. Um, we're very happy with it. It worked for us. Not saying you should get one, just saying that's what we've got. She's 33 kilos. 33 right? kilos, yeah. 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 Uh, so very happy with that. And we have 10 mil chain, is that right? Yes. Well, that's where, if you watch our future episodes, um, we've also got a bit of 12 mil chain. Mm. But watch that and I'll explain <laughs> what that's all about because that's important. Um the other thing, by the way, is we do not use an anchor drag uh, alarm or an app. Now, we did when we first started. We used the chart plotter uh, because back then that's all, the, all that we had. So mm. we set an alarm to sound when the boat moved more than X metres. Yes. But now we don't use an anchor alarm. No. Simply, we don't want to rely on that, do we? We don't want to rely on that because, A... We are now very happy with the way we anchor and our ground tackle. B, I sleep very lightly. And if there is any change in the weather, I'm up. Mm -hmm. I'm up and I'm checking. And I think that is more important than having relying on a piece of equipment that you're hoping will wake you up by sounding an alarm. I think it's better to be uh, just be a bit more mindful of 
how you've anchored and where you've anchored mm. and um, just be aware of Anyway, I guess if you're a heavy sleeper, you can't. Yes. You don't have that choice, do you? Perhaps you are relying on an alarm. Yeah, I, you know, it's six one half dozen the other. Yeah. I mean, I think some people might really appreciate it. I sleep heavily. You're quite often up, but then if the weather's really bad, we hear it. You know, we can hear it on. You can slapping on the boat. You can you can feel the waves. Remember, it's waves that matter probably more than wind. Mm -hmm. When it all gets up, we will take anchor watch. No matter whether it's day or night, then we'll then we'll do our three hours on, three hours off anchor watch just for peace of mind. Yep. The other one can sleep. Yeah. So it is important. But the technique generally, I would say, to newbies definitely practice, 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 practice. You've got to keep practicing with your boat and your setup until you are completely confident with it. When we started very early on in Turkey in Gumushluk. I think it was one of my first sails. We went to this beautiful place. It was very deep. We put the anchor down, and in the middle of the night we started dragging. And it was quite a small anchorage, so you know boats were quite close to each other. And we tried to re-anchor. We tried to anchor about three times. We mm. went round and round in circles. It's very early days for us. We couldn't do it. We couldn't do it. It was deep. We had an old CQR, <laughs> yeah. and as Liz says, we just weren't practiced no. enough, and we didn't have the confidence in in our technique. No. Uh, which, which of course we do now. Yes. Um, and don't be afraid to re-anchor. Yes. That's another really important thing. Don't be embarrassed because every single boat out there, including fishing boats, will have dragged. If they haven't, they're lying. <laughs> I think that's a bit of a bold statement. I mean, well, look, I have you know, everybody's dragged. Yeah, Come I suppose. On. Yeah, I suppose so. But I'm just thinking, in our however many years of cruising, we've actually only dragged. We dragged once on the Rockner simply because when we pulled it up, it had picked up half of the garbage of Borneo. Yes. Mm. A pair of old jeans, t shirts and, and what have you. Wasn't digging. And then previously I, I can remember we uh, we probably dragged three times on that CQR and that Two was times. that was due to just bad anchoring techniques. Yeah. But uh, on the whole we've been pretty good. Uh, yes, it does happen. But uh yes, practice your technique. Yeah. Definitely practice it. And the other thing is use a snubber. Yes. Really important we didn't know that. No nope. did we? Didn't know anything about snubbers when we first started, but you end up putting so much strain on your windlass uh, if you don't. And as Liz said earlier, when it comes to anchoring, it's not the wind, it's the waves. Mm. Uh, and it's that motion, the up-down motion of your bow moving up and down that will dislodge your anchor probably more than any other type of condition. Mm. And remember that an good anchors will reset. They expect to come out. They will not, they won't, won't take you through everything. Quite often that movement will mean your anchor comes out, but the good ones are designed to then reset straight away. Mm -hmm. And we felt that and we know that happens. Last time I remember was when we had that very bad blow in northern Borneo where we were in, um, oh, I can't remember the name of the place, but we were stuck on anchor watch for about 36 hours because it was so bad in that day. Oh. We couldn't get anywhere. Do you remember? Yeah, but that's the one I was talking about. Where ah. We ended up. Picking up jeans and T-shirts yes, and yes. nappies and plastic bags and everything else. I mean, the seabed must have been horrendous. Yes, uh, yes but we did. That We were stuck in that bay for three days mm. because it was blowing. So it was blowing bad. like 30 knots for three Minimum. days. Three days just non-stop. We couldn't go anywhere. And yes. as you said, we ended up staying on Anchor Watch yes. during the day. Yes. Yeah, it's very strange. Mm. That's the worst one, probably. Um, and finally, before we leave anchoring, I'm sure there will be questions and comments do don't, don't forget to put them in um in the comment section uh a quick word on mooring boys and why we seldom take them from our sponsor jamie <laughs> <laughs> well only because uh we first came across we never used them in turkey i don't no. think except when perhaps when we went up to a restaurant it was all med mooring there it was med mooring there but we never really used them and then when we got to southeast asia we, we just heard no, nothing but horror stories because they've got to be maintained. You've got to trust the person who laid the mooring boy and you've got to trust that they will maintain them. And when you look around, I'm not sure that I would trust many people. Yes, but uh, we've taken, at the moment, we're actually doing some work on the front of the boat. So it actually helps us to moor the boat rather than use our tackle. But we have heard the moorings here are pretty good and we're sheltered as well. So we're not getting any kind of weather coming through. So in that respect, we're pretty comfortable here. We are, and um, we know people who've left their boats here for months and mm. they've been fine. So this is, we know this anchorage, we know these moorings, we know they're good. We're also, we're on the edge. If anything kicks up, we can just let go and get out very, very quickly. 
we're very close. Mm. So this is all good. But I will say I am more comfortable anchoring with our gear than yes. I am taking a mooring. Yeah. And I know last year we took a mooring for a couple of weeks when we had really bad weather. And I was not stress-free, let's say. Yeah. I was constantly on edge because I just couldn't trust the mooring. It turned out we could trust the mooring because it did hold. But I think it's just familiarity. I was more familiar with our own tackle and knowing what that can handle versus an unknown mooring. Yeah. So it's a lot, for me, it's a lot less stressful being mm. on our own anchor gear. Mm. And that's where you want to get to, you know, with your comfort and your de-stressing. You want to feel so happy with your your technique and your gear that you, you'll happily anchor anywhere. Um, just very quickly before we go, um, we often have to be in 20 plus meters of water here in Indonesia, if anyone's thinking of coming here. Certainly um, Malaysia and Thailand, often not this deep at all, but you do need to pay out a lot of um, chain here. We mm -hmm. don't have road, we just have chain. And the, ide uh, the ideal of five to one, it's just not practical sometimes, is it? Three to one. Yeah, I know three to one. I don't think anyone it, does it, that, do it, it's, Yeah, I mean, for those who don't know, it is three to one is minimum scope. Yeah. Uh, if we can, we'll put out at least four to one. I think four to one is what we generally put out. We have been known to put out seven to one in, 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 shallow. Sh in shallow anchorages. Yes. Uh, but, you know, really three to one should see you through. It's when you start getting those waves and the fetch. So the more weight you've got holding the chain down on the seabed, the better. Mm. And when you're only at three to one and you've anchored in 20 meters, you only have 60 meters out and you've got one meter swell coming through and the boat mm. doing this, it's going to be constantly yeah. pulling on that anchor. So, mm. yeah. Okay, number six. Oh, there's another one, is yes, there? Yes, there is. Okay. I can say six. Oh, yes. Sorry for interrupting, but while I've got you here, if you like what we do and you want to support us and become a Patreon or join us on FTB Mates or even drop a quid in the rum fund, go to followtheboat.com forward slash pub. Of course, come to the pub. Number six is stowage or storage, depending on your definition. <laughs> well... They're two different things, aren't they? As we now know, because we weren't sure about this. You said storage and I said, no, it, isn't it stowage when it's on a boat? They are two different things. Uh, both will serve you well and relieve some of that stress if you get them nailed right. But go on, what's the, what's the difference between the two? Oh, this is what I found on the internet. Storage is the act of placing material or other supplies on board and stowage relates to the act of securing those items stored in such a manner they don't shift or move during transit. And getting both of those things right will alleviate some stress. Yeah rolling it right back to the beginning when you first move onto your boat it is important to make sure everything has its own place everything has its own home it doesn't matter if your screwdriver is in the same drawer as your toothpaste if that's where they live that's where they live and they will stay living in that drawer and both of you or everyone on the boat knows that that's where they are Ideally, you should have an inventory because we've got um, lockers on the boat that are under lockers, under lockers, away, and, and you have to, it takes ages to get to what's in there. If, you do, if you're not sure what's in there, it means you're just taking everything out all the time to get to those things. So try and get a spreadsheet together of where things are and put the things you only use once a year at the bottom, you know, at the front, whatever it is. Uh, but yeah, getting the storage right, very, very important. Stowage? And the stowage, because if you don't stow properly, when you're off on a passage, you may just be going around the headland to the next island, but you could suddenly hit two metre waves. I think the, the worst accidents we've had at sea where we've had things flying off is, is not in really, really bad weather because you're more prepared for that. It is when you're literally <laughs> nipping around the corner, you think, oh, it's flat calm. And then when you're halfway around and you're anchoring and then suddenly the heavens open <laughs> and you've left all your hatches open and then downstairs doing ballet trying to catch things and, and, <laughs> and close things so uh, stupid of us yes always stow no matter how short the journey it's really worth doing isn't mm. it mm. i think we've reached the end of our six do you want to add any more if you find this topic interesting and would like to continue the conversation come and join the follow the boat discord community look for the link in the description it's free there's always something we've forgotten, which is an opportunity for you guys to tell us in the comments what we've forgotten and correct us. We'd love to hear from you. 
I, I suppose really the only other things are specifics like a portable generator and we've mentioned the water maker because we always go on about our water maker things like that certainly they just give us a bit more independence and contingency so that we are not relying on having to say go into a marina to charge up or to top up with water yeah we're not stressing about where we're going to get our water from we're not stressing mm. about the batteries so that's two stresses immediately removed by having those two things so yeah yeah i mean as you say there's loads and loads of stuff we could talk about so just hope that this little video podcast um gives people some cause for thinking again if you're going to be buying a boat about some of these valuable i think important points don't mm. you yeah, I think they're I think they're important. They're, it's stuff we've learned over the years, usually by trial and error, um, to get always right. Always by error. Yes, yeah, always error, always. <laughs> but um, if if this helps in any way, we've done our job. Yes. Didn't you want to end on a little Boy Scout quote? Oh yeah, I just wanted to say, <laughs> be a Boy Scout. Assume that things will go wrong, and always be prepared. Yes, carry spares for your spares yes always carry spares and yeah as you say just have contingencies and be prepared expect things to go wrong expect them to go wrong at the worst moment as well yeah and if you're prepared for that you'll sleep better yeah well thank you very much for listening <laughs> if you've been watching uh, let us know your thoughts in the youtube comments and uh, i guess we'll see you next week in our next episode yeah. Bye. Bye.